Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dr. Libby Sonye, and I'm the Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. As an independent source of data, research, and pertinent information for policymakers, the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children works to advance policies that ensure Louisiana's young children have access to high quality early care and education. We have partnered with the Louisiana Department of Education and Schoolhouse Connection to present to you today the urgency in providing access to over 5,500 children aged birth to three who are experiencing homelessness across Louisiana. Access to high quality early learning programs such as childcare, early head start and home visiting can unlock the support that their, their families need, yet only 8.5% are enrolled in a program. Louisiana is part of a national movement related to prenatal to three work, focusing on health, maternal care, family life, economic security, and early care and learning. We know well the first year, three years of life shape the future of a child's life. We are fortunate to be able to be a part of this movement created by the Pritzker Children's Initiative, who has an audacious goal to really pursue change to change the trajectory of infants, toddlers, and families in a meaningful way. Through the Child Pritzker Children's Initiative, we are making new connections, including Schoolhouse Connection, which is why we're here today to learn more about homelessness in the prenatal to three years. I'm now pleased to introduce Karen Powell, Deputy Assistant Superintendent for Early Childhood for the Louisiana Department of Education, who will provide to you an overview of the issue with child care for our children experiencing homelessness. Thank you, Dr. Sonier. Thank you for having me here with you today, and thank you for partnering on these projects together so that we can better serve the children and families of Louisiana. So while Schoolhouse Connection estimates, as Dr. Sonier said, that there are approximately 5,500 homeless children from birth through age three in Louisiana, the child count conducted by publicly funded early learning sites in Louisiana shows a significantly lower number of those children being served in care. So based on the October 2021 child count, approximately 700 homeless children were in care at a publicly funded site as of October 1st, 2021. And that is a drastically lower number than the estimated number of children who could be served. And the majority of those children, approximately 50% of those children were actually four-year-olds being served in school settings. Approximately 30% of those children were served in early Head Start or Head Start settings. And approximately 15% of those children were served in childcare settings. So what that means is that very few homeless birth through three-year-olds in Louisiana are actually currently being served in publicly funded early learning sites. And we know that birth to three is precisely the time in which their brain architecture is being established and is at its point of fastest development. So that low number is of great concern to all of us. You can move the slide forward. So for families that know about the Child Care Assistance Program or CCAP in Louisiana, our subsidy program, our application does contain information about how families can indicate that they are homeless. And knowing that families may not realize what situations might qualify them for homeless benefits, our application does share some defining examples. So it gives instructions and definitions for families who could be considered categorically homeless in Louisiana. The application says, if you are homeless right now, please check the I am homeless checkbox below. You are considered homeless if you do not have a fixed regular nighttime residence or your primary nighttime residence is a temporary accommodation in a supervised shelter, a halfway house, the residence of another person, or a place not designed for regular sleeping, such as a hallway, bus station, or lobby. Um, I know that Erin will go into greater detail about this definition, but part of the challenge for homeless families is that they do not um, necessarily know what definition of homelessness would qualify them for services and benefits. So this application does try to help make that clearer. You can move on to the next slide. Because we do have to conduct verifications um, based on federal rule, 
to ensure that families do actually meet these um, eligibility criteria. And because we do need to provide updates to families about their cases, the department does need a way to get in touch with applicant families. But of course, recognizing that homeless families face particular challenges, the department does try to consider and provide alternative ways to reach families. So the application also notes that families can still receive benefits even if they do not have an address, but that we do need an address by which to contact them. And so the application notes other possible ways and other kinds of addresses that families might provide to the department so that we can keep in touch with them, so that they might provide the address of a friend or family member, the address of a shelter or a halfway home. We also note if an applicant does not have an address to give, that they can leave those fields empty and still apply for services, and that we will let them know an address in the parish that they identify at which they can pick up mail if they, um, based on the parish that they say they spend the most time in. You can move forward. So the reason that these homeless definitions are highlighted in the department's application for the subsidy program is because we do consider homeless families a prioritized household and a prioritized population to receive Louisiana child care assistance funds. And that's because we know that homeless families are particularly vulnerable and face particularly high levels of stress. Because of those high levels of daily stress that the children and their caregivers face, we know that it's even more critical that these children have a stable daily environment and that their parents or their guardians have at least one less worry about who will take care of their children while those parents and guardians have the opportunity to seek out and receive critical services and supports needed to move them out of homelessness. So homeless children and families are a prioritized population in Louisiana. And move forward. Obviously, homelessness can be detrimental to people of all ages, but as a recent report of the Administration of Children and Families explains, it's particularly damaging to young children's development, sometimes permanently affecting their health and their well being. Children who experience homelessness are more likely to experience developmental delays and behavioral issues, both of which impact their school readiness and their short and long-term success in school and beyond. And according to the National Center on Family Homelessness, homeless children are eight times more likely to be asked to repeat a grade, three times as likely to be placed in special education classes, and twice as likely to score lower on standardized tests. And so we know that high quality early childhood education programs can cushion those negative effects of homelessness by providing children with stability, a safe environment, and helping them to develop the skills they need to succeed in school and life. So again, that's why it is so critical that this vulnerable population has access to these programs. Next slide. So the challenge, of course, is that homeless families may struggle to access early care and education because they may not know about programs such as the Child Care Assistance Program. Furthermore, even if they know about such services and opportunities, though we strive to simplify the application and verification process for these families, they may also struggle to complete their applications and even access the application. And furthermore, even those who identify this resource and navigate access to benefit from this service may struggle to keep their children in care due to their frequent mobility. Um, they may be moving from location to location on a daily basis. They may not be able to be close to their prior care setting, even if they get connected to one. And then, of course, they may have limited transportation to get their child to an identified child care setting. What the department seeks to do currently is work with a number of partners that we contract with and support to try to help reach these families and help them access the system and navigate the system. So we contract, for example, with Child Care Resource and Referral Agencies, CCRNRs, 
that can help families identify local care and education options that meet their needs. Many of our CCRNRs actually have existing partnerships with local providers of homeless services, and we want to work with the CCRNRs further to strengthen those relationships and prioritize that outreach. CCRNRs can also provide trauma-informed training to early learning providers to help them better understand the particular challenges faced by homeless children and families and better respond to and serve those children and families in their care once those children and families access their care. The department contracts with mental health consultants to provide mental health supports to children, their families, and the early learning sites that support these children and families. And to help those sites, again, understand the particular stressors faced by these children and families. Our Ready Start Networks and Community Network Lead Agencies, which are the local entities that unite all early care and education providers and communities, strive to meet family needs. So we are working with them to provide information specific to homeless families during their coordinated enrollment campaigns and really encouraging them to provide targeted outreach to homeless families to help ensure that they know about the Child Care Assistance Program, about Early Head Start and Head Start, about LA4 and NSECD, and that they are being connected more effectively to these services. They and early childhood guides can also help families apply for opportunities and assistance and they can also develop deeper and deeper family engagement opportunities and supports for families in their communities and link all families, including homeless families, to needed wraparound services in their communities. So the department has already begun work to help strengthen the supports provided to homeless families, but we're committed to continuing to strengthen those supports and partnerships ourselves. Excuse me, Karen. Um, this is Tony. I just wanted like y'all to add early steps into that list of um, of supports that y'all are talking about and trying to get the word out about because that's an area that we try to help support as well and have challenges meeting, you know, the same challenges you guys have. So it'd be nice to add them into that list. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. And we will. And now I will turn it over to Erin Patterson, the Director of Education Initiatives at Schoolhouse Connection, to talk about the research that they do, the strategies that they are employing to help states better serve homeless children and their families. Thank you so much, Karen. And I want to say a special thanks to the Louisiana Department of Education and the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children for leading this conversation. It's such an important conversation, um, particularly now as we see the impacts of homelessness increasing um, across states. And I'm, on the next slide, I just want to share a little bit about Schoolhouse Connection in case you're not familiar. We are a national nonprofit advocacy organization, and our mis mission is intentionally overcoming homelessness through education. And we say that for a few reasons. Number one, we know that research shows the more education a person is able to attain, the less likely they are to experience or continue experiencing homelessness. And we also know that um, schools and early childhood programs and institutions of higher education are often the first place and sometimes the only place when a child and their family are seen and identified as experiencing homelessness and can be connected to critical supports beyond just educational stability and attainment. And so we work at a number of levels, including um, federal policy and advocacy. We work with a number of states on um, their state policies to help students continue their education even if they are experiencing homelessness. We work across um, the early childhood space as well, providing practical assistance. And I always say the jewel in our crown is our network of young scholars who have themselves experienced homelessness and are pursuing um, their post-secondary education with financial and case management support from Schoolhouse Connection. So I encourage you to check out our website. Um, we offer a number of resources. Um, but in the next couple of minutes today on the next uh, slide, and you can actually um, move right through this overview title slide, thank you. I wanna spend a few minutes um, really um, emphasizing the definition of homelessness that Karen shared a few minutes ago, because this is the first thing that it's important um, to understand for those in the early childhood space. Um, the federal McKinney-Vento Act defines homelessness as 
child and youth who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. And you can see there are a couple of ways um, that families can experience homelessness, including living in cars, parks, and being in buildings, living in emergency or transitional shelters, and this would also include domestic violence shelters, living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, campgrounds, um, due to lack of adequate um, accommodations. And then importantly, sharing the housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or similar reasons. And that top um, bullet point right there is what we consider doubled up, or you might hear it referred to as couch surfing. Um, and I want to spend a minute emphasizing this. And the first thing I'll say is that the McKinney-Vento Act um, has been adopted by K-12 school systems all across the country, but also importantly, both the Head Start performance standards and the federal child care regulations have adopted this same definition of homelessness. And so as Karen um, spoke about a few minutes ago, this means that child care providers, licensed providers who receive federal funds um, uh, are under this definition of homelessness, mm -hmm. prioritize. We got in the headsets over there. They prioritize, yes. and I'm just going to ask folks to mute if you can. I don't need. Um, child care programs um, prioritize the enrollment of children and their families who are experiencing homelessness as defined by this. Um, and so that's the first thing to say, because I think when whenever we think of the word homeless, for a lot of people, it conjures images of maybe a person living on the street in a tent or in a shelter, um, but it's so much more. And on the next slide, I want to say a little bit more about this doubled up piece and why it's so important to understand the impacts of homelessness, including doubled up on young children in particular. Um, and I, I love the phrase Karen used, of, I think it was something like the architecture of brain development happening in these early years, which is so important. And so when you're coming from a child development perspective, you know the importance of consistency and stability and safety and routine, um, all of which are very difficult to establish when a family is in a doubled up living situation. This often means that a family is moving from one home or one apartment to another every week, every night, every month. There's um, lack of consistency, lack of assurance in where a young child and their family might sleep from one night to the next. We have often heard stories at Schoolhouse of um, young mothers, for example, who have said, you know, I felt like I had to always shush my child because I didn't want to bother the leaseholder. I didn't want to bother the homeowner. And when you think about the importance of development in those early years, the last thing you want to be doing is shushing a child when they're learning their communication and their verbal skills and social emotional skills. And so that's why we really emphasize that um, doubled up is just as traumatic and harmful to children as other experiences of homelessness. And in fact, we know that in the K-12 system, about 75% of our students experiencing homelessness are in doubled up situations. And so it's um, really important to understand those vulnerabilities when working with families experiencing homelessness. On the next slide, I wanna um, just mention, <clears throat> excuse me, um, another part of our definition of homelessness includes unaccompanied youth. And I mentioned this because um, this last point on the slide, a, a young person is considered an, considered an unaccompanied youth if their parents force them out of the home due to conflict, including because of pregnancy. And so this is when we see some significant overlaps between our um, older youth population experiencing homelessness and our infants experiencing homelessness who are born to those um, teen parents. Um, and so it's important to understand as we get into some strategies and best practices for working with families with young children experiencing homelessness, um, that reaching out to those programs and those systems that are working with older youth experiencing homelessness is just as important um, because they are also more likely to become or to get someone pregnant. On the next slide, I want to talk about the consequences of homelessness for young children, which are serious. Um, some of these do not um, need to be emphasized or repeated, but I'm going to anyway to make sure we're, we're um, 
speaking from the same place. Um, obviously, homelessness and in infancy has been found to be associated with delays in language, literacy, social emotional development. It can put children at risk for later academic problems. Um, and the younger and longer a child experiences homelessness, the greater the cumulative negative toll, um, negative health outcomes. Um, so the, the duration is just as important as the experience in terms of the consequences. And lastly, the impacts of homelessness on young children are long lasting. And in fact, there's new research that shows that even after a child and their family have um, received permanent housing, the traumatic impacts of that experience for the child can show up anywhere from six months all the way up to two years, even after the child has been placed in permanent housing. So this is important when we're talking about um, early childhood programs and schools and systems of education, because this can look very specific. This can be at three o'clock when it's time to pack up to go home. That's when the child in your classroom starts acting out because they still are holding on to that fear and that trauma of not knowing where they will go when they step outside those school doors, when that program or that school represents their only safety and stability that they have known. Um, on the next slide, you'll see, um, to put a finer point on these long-term consequences, um, this first bullet point is one that I harp on often. Um, high school students experiencing homelessness experience the lowest graduation rate of any group of students. So if you look at the overall graduation rate in the US um, and then break it down by race, ethnicity, students with disabilities, English learners, Students experiencing homelessness consistently have the lowest high school graduation rate. And I know that if you're an early childhood educator or advocate, um, you understand that high school graduation doesn't happen overnight. It starts at birth. Development and learning start at birth. And so when we're talking about our children experiencing homelessness, if we want to improve their long-term outcomes academically, we have to start early. And that's why it's so significant um, for families experiencing homelessness to be able to access high quality early learning programs that can mitigate the traumatic impacts of homelessness for their young children and provide that stability and consistency. High school students who experience homelessness are also 10 times more likely to become pregnant or to get someone pregnant. So again, going back to those overlaps of our older youth experiencing homelessness and our infants who are born into a family that is experiencing homelessness, um, this unfortunately can become cyclical, but access to early learning programs can help break that cycle and have a two generational impact on both the child and the family and parent. And again, in addition to the academic impacts, homelessness in the early years can cause developmental delays social emotional challenges, and long-term trauma. So on the next slide, or the next two slides, I wanna lay out for you what both Libby and Karen have alluded to in terms of the numbers in Louisiana. Um, knowing all of these um, impacts of homelessness, um, in Louisiana, we found through a, a recent report that Schoolhouse Connection did that there are 5,504 children ages birth to three who are experiencing homelessness in the state of Louisiana. Of those, an estimated 473 are enrolled in an early learning program. Um, and in just a minute, I'll talk more about what we mean by an early learning program, but that's a little, a little over eight and a half percent of children experiencing homelessness in Louisiana. Um, infants and toddlers are enrolled in an early learning program. Um, that's one in 12. And so we see a lot of opportunity for growth. And Karen's already alluded to um, some of the, the policies that are already in place. Um, and I'm gonna talk in just a few minutes about some of the practices and strategies that can help make those policies a reality. On the next slide, um, I have a breakdown, <clears throat> excuse me, of the program enrollment. And just a few things to say about the data here. Um, for childcare, early Head Start and home visiting, we used um, data that is reported to the federal and or national organization level. So for child care and early Head Start, um, we access data that's reported from the state of Louisiana to the U.S. Office of Child Care and to the Head Start Enterprise System, which is how they collect information for Head Start and early Head Start grantees. 
For home visiting, um, there are, if you are in the early childhood um, space, you know there are a number of home visiting models. We were only able to access data for parents as teachers, but there are more models that exist across Louisiana. And so we are curious and always welcome new data um, to make sure we can provide you the most robust profile as possible. Um, but we did find that for childcare programs in Louisiana, they enroll 282 infants and toddlers who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and another important thing to say is that there are likely more families experiencing homelessness being served by these programs. They just haven't been identified. And in just a minute, I'll talk about some of the implications of that um, and ways to help families see themselves um, in that definition and understand that there are resources available to help. Um, early Head Start, again, um, infants and toddlers aged birth to three experiencing homelessness, 168 enrolled in Early Head Start programs across Louisiana. Um, notably, we do not have data on um, pregnant or expectant parents who are experiencing homelessness and who might be served by Early Head Start. That is an eligible population, but we did not, um, we were not able to access data on that. And then lastly, home visiting programs. Again, this is parents as teachers. There are 23 infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness who are served by parents as teachers in the state of Louisiana. Um, so you can see here this breakdown. And I think I saw a question in the chat um, about um, receiving access to the presentation slides. I, I'm looking to the Louisiana Policy Institute team, but I think that that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and I'll share my contact information at the end of this as well. On our next slide, I want to talk about a few key takeaways <clears throat> and then, excuse me, offer some strategies and best practices to you. So the first thing to say, based on these numbers, is that infants, toddlers, and families experiencing homelessness are significantly under-enrolled in early childhood programs. And so that's one place to start, um, is by making sure that um, the, all the policies and, that Karen laid out are being implemented, and that child care and early Head Start providers and home visiting providers and community partners are aware of the definition um, and doing everything possible to reach out to those families who are experiencing homelessness to make sure they're connected to high quality programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Secondly, um, just like I, I alluded to a, a minute ago, some infants, toddlers, and families who are experiencing homelessness may be enrolled in your programs. They just aren't identified yet. And that's a critical piece because unless a family is identified as experiencing homelessness, they cannot then be connected to the other supports that they need beyond childcare and early Head Start and home visiting. And we know that early childhood programs are uniquely positioned to make those connections, to provide those wraparound supports, to be that guide for the family to navigate, um, whether it's a housing application, um, another subsidy application, whatever their need may be, early childhood programs are uniquely positioned to provide that support. And then the last thing is that we need more data and we need better reporting mechanisms um, so that we can get a cl as clear a sense as possible of the need in order to inform both policy and practice. Um, so this data is imperfect and it's incomplete likely and it's like that for all of the states that we, um, excuse me, that we analyzed. Um, there are uh, different ways of reporting. There are different um, interpretations of definitions. And so one thing that we advocate for at Schoolhouse um, is to stand up your own data systems within your state um, focused on children experiencing homelessness so that we can have a better picture of the need among infants, toddlers, and families. So on the next slides, <clears throat> I'm going to talk through some strategies and best practices that we have found useful and successful uh, across the field in terms of increasing the enrollment of infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness. On the next slide, you'll see um, the first thing is identification. And so going back to that McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness, the first step is to make sure that everyone working with families understands that definition. And that goes from state agencies to state advocates, um, all the way through local community-based providers, 
to um, bus drivers, to uh, lunchroom workers, anyone who comes in contact with a family in a program should be aware of the definition of homelessness and know what to do if you suspect that a family is experiencing homelessness. And so um, at the program level, that means offering training and professional development. Um, at the community or the state level, that might mean um, offering more supports and resources to those programs so that they know um, and understand that definition. We also recommend striking the word homeless from your enrollment forms. And it seems counterintuitive, but what we found is that a lot of people, um, like we mentioned earlier, when they hear the word homeless, they think, well, I'm not living on the street and I'm not in a shelter. When in fact they are in one of those other categories of the definition and could very well be experiencing homelessness. One strategy we found um, successful is some programs will take um, that McKinney-Vento definition and sort of flip it. And they'll ask the question, has any of the following situations applied to you in the past 30 days, the past month, however you want to phrase it, and then just offer a checkbox. I stayed with another person. I stayed in a motel. I lived in a car. I see, you know, um, working through that definition. And so you're taking the word homeless out. So that takes out the stigma and it also takes out the confusion. And you're offering the definition to them and asking them if they see themselves in any of those situations. Um, and then lastly, under identification, um, we recommend multiple points of identification throughout the year. Um, most K-12 school systems, most um, Head Start child care programs, um, you're probably identifying um, during enrollment, whether you do spring or summer enrollment, or maybe it's um, an August enrollment. Unfortunately, homelessness does not coincide with our school schedule. And the homelessness can happen to any family at any point in time. And that's why it's so important to have multiple check-ins throughout the year so that you're reassessing um, if a family situation has changed. And you can ask it just like that um, in January, perhaps when families come back from the holiday break, having a quick um, survey or questionnaire that goes out, has your living situation changed in, in the recent weeks or month? Um, and offering them a space and an opportunity um, to indicate that something might have changed and they might be experiencing homelessness and they might need a little more assistance. The second piece of um, increasing enrollment, um, we often hear in our early childhood programs especially that outreach is hard. Um, it's not like the K-12 system where you might have a natural feeder program. You are the origin. You are the origin point for getting families into education. And so outreach is really hard. And that's where we suggest relying on your partners um, to refer families who are experiencing homelessness and who have younger children to your program. This is where your K-12 school systems um, can be really, really helpful. Every school district across the country is required to have a homeless education liaison. And their job is to identify any K-12 student who is experiencing homelessness, but they are also required by law to identify and refer younger siblings experiencing homelessness to an early childhood program. And the law actually lists out and specifies childcare, Head Start, Early Head Start, or another high quality program. And so making sure that um, if you are a childcare provider in the community, making sure you have that partnership with your local school system, making sure you know the name and email address of your homeless education liaison. Um, and if you don't, Schoolhouse Connection has a directory on our website of every single school district homeless education liaison. Um, it's on our homepage if you scroll down. Um, and so making that connection is gonna be really, really important. Similarly, um, partnering with community agencies, um, not just to receive referrals of families experiencing homelessness, but as an, a way to help support those families once identified, to be able to sit down with them and say, you know what, I don't have everything you need to apply for this job or to apply for this subsidy or, or complete this housing application, but I do have a partner at this community agency who can help you. Um, and making sure families understand where they might be prioritized for assistance um, and making those connections with those community agencies. The last thing I'll say in terms of strategies, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Libby in just a minute. Um, on data, like I mentioned, we need more data, we need better data, um, but we recommend you start with your existing data to set actionable goals. 
So in Louisiana, we know that about eight and a half percent of your infants and toddlers experiencing homelessness are enrolled in a, an early learning program. We would love to see that increase. Start with something that's actionable and measurable, and maybe next year uh, around this time, we'll see that that enrollment rate is at 10%, and in two years, it's up to 15%. And so those incremental gains are going to really move the needle in the long run. But start with the existing data to set those goals. Then you can ask yourself what additional data is needed. So I've already identified we need more home visiting data. I think that's going to be really important to understanding the picture of who is being served already in the state of Louisiana, because I suspect that it is more families who are experiencing homelessness who are being served, but we need to know. And so assessing those additional data points that are needed is going to be really important. Part of the next phase of our work at Schoolhouse with this data is to do some breakdowns by race and ethnicity. And I think that's going to be really key as well to knowing where there is the most opportunity um, for increasing those enrollment numbers. And then lastly, and why I'm so glad to be on this webinar with the Louisiana Department of Education and the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, um, you want to share this data with other agencies and stakeholders. Share. I, I always say I will talk to whoever will listen to me about this, um, whether it's your housing authority, um, whether it's your K-12 system, to pose the question, hey, if you're seeing younger siblings, can you refer them to us? We need to get them enrolled in early childhood programs. Um, make a list of those other agencies and stakeholders and programs who should know about this data. Your state legislature should know about this data as they're making decisions about funding. Um, so making sure that anyone who works with families who might be experiencing homelessness has access to this data is going to be really important and can help build those relationships and strengthen those existing relationships in the long run. Um, I'm going to pause here and I want to turn it back over to Libby because I think she's going to lead us in our closing and some Q&A. But thank you again so much for your time. Thanks so much, Erin. And thank you too, Karen. Uh, we now really want to welcome any questions or comments that you all may have. Uh, we really want to have a discussion here uh, and ways that we can learn from you all and your experiences. Feel free to put them in the um, the text box, or if you want to hop off mute and ask something too, it's fine. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> I'll just say it was a great presentation. It gives us a lot to think about in um, setting our goals since the numbers are really telling in terms of the need out there. So um, I appreciate the information. And we will share the presentation, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, as well as a re the recording of this webinar to everybody that registered. So you'll have that to be able to go back to for a reference. Same with me. Um, I've been out of touch in a little bit uh, for a little while. Um, I want to add uh, another um, part to uh, folks that you can access. We always kind of forget churches and uh, religious organizations, not just the church uh, itself, but those that are religious organizations. Particularly, I think um, the pastor's wife or the women in the church because uh, other women will come to the church uh, women's uh, group. And so kind of really narrow it down to um, who exactly do uh, parents go to uh, within those systems, uh, that type of thing. Um, also things like neighborhood, um, community centers, uh, the hairdressers, the barbershops, whatever, um, to have that because that then gives you the friendliness, if you will, about looking for people versus I, I, DCFS and, and education do a great job, but that's kind of post, you know, after they find people. But uh, those areas, you could really find people in a, a friendlier, I don't know what else to call it, uh, less clinical, less uh, data, 
you know, getting it um, into that kind of system. So those types of things. And also the last part, just like the church ladies, it's also finding in the communities um, where uh, you know these numbers are coming from, um, who's unidentified. I think that's the biggest thing, uh, that confusion about 5,500 versus what's been reported. And uh, we know there's much more um, many people because of our poverty levels and you know all of that, uh, education level and poverty level. So you've got to kind of work the community. And we don't do that much from the top down. We kind of do the other part. Thanks so much, Jay. Also, really good to see so many um, colleagues and friends over the years uh, to be a part of this webinar today. Y'all have been doing the work for so long. And as Jay pointed out, there's so many places, access points that we can you know, help find our families. And then Aaron shared in the chat, for those of y'all who are interested in um, their report, including, including our pro profile for Louisiana, there's a link in um, the chat there. Anybody else? Libby, if I could, I'm sorry, I just want to briefly pick up on that last comment because there was so much there and so much wisdom in it. And one one point I want to emphasize is that a lot, I, I say a lot, I think a lot of the um, lack of identification is due in large part to a lack of trust in communities to the system. And that's worth saying out loud because of the historical implications of um, the way that we have structured our governments and school systems in this country. And it has um, it has disproportionately impacted communities of color. And we see that in our numbers of homelessness. Families of color are disproportionately impacted. And they are also less likely to trust someone who is coming from a system and saying, if you just tell us, we'll help you. There's a lot of lack of trust trust here. And so I really love the point that was just made about um, relying on your community partners, your faith-based organizations, your um, barber shops, your salons, um, people that families in the community trust, um, and relying on those relationships. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Brandy asks, did the 168 head, early Head Start number include youth in early steps? If early steps is an early Head Start grantee, then it did, but it is not. So it did not include early steps. And that is that is a, a great piece that we would love to be able to include. And so if that if there is data from early steps, on the number of families and children experiencing homelessness who are being served, um, then we would love to know and be able to include that in Louisiana's profile. I Thanks can for, check on that and get back to you um, with some numbers. Thanks, Tony. And thanks for bringing that forward, Brandy. That was a good question to Thank highlight. You. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, uh, before we sign off, I really want to extend our gratitude to both Schoolhouse Connection and our friends at the Department of Education for coming together to make this webinar happen. Um, we at the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, we couldn't do this work without these types of partnerships and without all of you who are here today. As I've shared my sentiment with, sentiment with many people, um, and if you haven't heard it, this won't be the last time you hear it from me. Uh, we are in the we are in the business of saving lives, um, and part of saving lives is making sure that we can account for our babies um, and, and the types of supports that they need, where they live, where their parents work, and to really understand what the fundamental needs are for our families. And so, thank you for helping us do that work. Um, we are humbled every day to be able to be in the position um, to serve our, our serve our family and serve our state. And I, I know that uh, many of y'all feel the same way. So again, a special thanks to you all for joining us today and for actively participating in this very important call to action. It will take all of us to bring attention to the crisis to decrease the numbers and ensure we fill these seats um, and make sure that we understand what our families need. So again, thank you. We will be sending out a follow-up email with the PowerPoint presentation and recording of this webinar Again, thank you all.